period 800 to 200 to help elucidate um, our confusion that we have when we are faced with incidents like the arbitrations that we've had recently where people have been um, caught literally red-handed doing things that are almost unforgivable. And in this instance, I'm going to um, use uh, Gadani Malangu as an example. I'm sure you saw her on television. Um, I remember the absolute amazement. I was watching this with someone else in the room, and she was questioned just towards the end of the arbitration by a person called uh, an advocate, I think her name is Gwita, and she said to her now, do you at the end of all this, now accept that you are responsible for the deaths of all the people that were under your care. And it was, it was absolutely astonishing to see that she could, under no circumstances, actually bring herself to say, yes, I accept that my choices um, led to the death of these people, therefore I'm accountable for their demise. She could actually not do it. And it, it is a very puzzling thing to see if you come from a monotheistic background, in this case Judaism, Christianity or Islam, because we understand and we are, it's hammered into Judaism especially, the concept of accountability. Now how did this start? So okay, let's start with how Judaism got to where it is and what shaped us to be accountable and responsible and compassionate. Okay, in about 800 BC, momentous event, events occurred. Um, the tribal areas in the Middle East and in almost all across the ancient world, the ancient Near East, and even as far as China, momentous events occurred. And they're very strange because they almost seem to occur in synchronicity. And this movement where people suddenly moved out of uh, agrarian societies and they started little villages and states and towns and suddenly they were not confined to their tribal areas, there was multicultural societies, there was trade, power moved from kings and rulers and the, the palace and the small priests and the small temples to the marketplace because it was the beginning of a market-driven economy with big production, with trade, with uh, oil going, for example, from the um, highlands in, in Israel uh, to Assyria and all over trade from Egypt everything was crisscrossing and of course Israel was in the crossroads of all this and all this crisscrossed you know, crisscrossing was go on, going on and at the same time the peasants who were in that area um, now were not just locked in their little tribal areas where everything was equal but they were now moving into cities living around the cities their production of oil that they produced was taken from them very little left for them uh, no serious remuneration and for the first time in the world it was the sense of inequality, whereas in tribal societies that always been equality. <laughs> and there was suddenly a sharp divide between what we would call the lower class and the upper class, which in that time shrunk to a very small 2%. So 2% of the population controlled everyone else, had all the benefits of this new market-driven economy, the beginning of capitalism, and this inequality made people question their religious values that they had prior to this and they realized that the gods that they understood weren't working for them and they started to revise their concept of god and also if you move from your tribal areas where each tribe had its own specific concept of god that was only relevant to that particular area and you're suddenly all in a huge uh, single area you now have to revise your concept of God because now God has to be universal for everybody. So there was a revision of the concept of God. And with that went the idea of icons and symbols. So religion in Israel became very iconoclastic. In other words, no more symbols, no more images, no more concept of a God that you knew. And as the prophets emerged, 
the leaders of this new movement that occurred all over the world, the Axial Age. Okay. The prophets started to lay down the framework for what Judaism is today. Prior to this, Judaism in the early part of the Bible, you read that God is almost a war God. He takes revenge and he controls and he sends storms and all types of things. But after 800, God diminishes in the actual presence of man and is removed. So what happened here in Israel where it started and throughout the ancient world, including China, was that for the first time, man separated the sacred realm from the profane. So it was uncoupled. Before the Axial Age, the realms were coupled. The blue is the sacred or transcendental, and the red is the profane. They were actually coupled together. So what happens in that realm, which is the realm of religion prior to 800, is that the sacred and the profane are one. So your gods and your concept of sacred walks with you. Hence the concept in African society of your ancestors willing you and controlling your life because these realms are coupled. Okay? But once the Axial Age came and there was the need to find a new God that was powerful beyond this small space, that could be with them even if things went wrong like the Assyrian conquest of the Northern Kingdom and they went into exile, their God went with them because he wasn't confined to the Northern Kingdom and he sustained them until they returned and then when the Babylonians sacked them, they still had this God because their concept of God now changed from a God who was controlling to a God who cared, a paternal God in Judaism. And then from there, the paternal God became one who was also one who punished his children if they didn't follow him. So there was this concept of, okay, you've got to follow God, but if you don't follow God, things go wrong. So you've got to understand consequences of your actions. If you don't follow God, if you don't do what he asks of you, things will go wrong. And this is what the, the prophets then told the people in 800 and, and down to 600. They said to them, Isaiah, you are spending too much time on sacrifice. Sacrifice now diminishes because you can't appease an abstract deity with sacrifice. You must appease a sacred, a sacred deity now with ethical conduct because that is the only way you can appease a God that becomes unknowable and removed. Ethical conduct now becomes the key issue. Treat the stranger in your midst uh, properly because you have been a stranger yourself in the land of Israel. Um, be kind to the widow, be kind to the orphan. All these injunctions now come forward that you now have to walk your talk of being sacred within yourself because as God goes up, and the realm divides, and you've got that up here, and the reds down here. The people responsible here now are men themselves. So men now become responsible for their own actions, individually as single people. And they learn to understand that their actions now have consequences not only for them or their families, but for generations continuously down the line. And they also discover, I'm going to open this door because I'm hot. It's men, of course. Then they also discover <coughs> that with being accountable like this and becoming the sacred, then becoming part of you, you then have to walk your sacredness, and that translates to social justice. Because if man is on earth and God is above, man is responsible for other men's welfare. Not God. You are responsible to see that I don't starve if I fall on hard times. We are meant to take care of the weak. And that is why social justice is such an integral part of Judaism. It was hammered into us that we have to take responsibility for man. Because on earth, we are responsible for the welfare of men. Um, 
Now let's move on to African traditional society. In African traditional societies, um, the realm is always coupled. And until Africa came into <coughs> contact with Europeans, they never understood the need for a separate realm because their lifestyle was ideally suited to the coupled realm. It was tribal based, it was contained, it was safe, there was no multicultural uh, connections or life experience in that tribal society um, because the realm is coupled. God walks with you. Your ancestors walk with you. Everything is all combined. When everything is all combined, there is no concept of individuality unlike here. So in African society, there is a concept of accountability, but it's it is a group accountability, not an individual one. And unless something like, for example, if a man's wife is unfaithful, unless the act is witnessed, there is no, no accountability. But if it is witnessed, it is not a concept of accountability that comes into the issue. It's a concept of shame, because the wife has shamed the husband. So there's still no concept of, okay, I've done something wrong. There's no guilt. It's shame. Which is why, even today, after exposure to a lot of Christianity and missionary work, African societies are going through the axial age. They are starting to decouple the two areas. There is still this lingering idea that I'm not an individual, and I cannot be responsible for anything because I don't, I'm not separated from the sacred because what controls me are the spirits, the ancestors, and the God around me. So I cannot be accountable on my own. So maybe we should cut Malangu slack. And I mean, I say this with difficulty because we don't know what she was exposed to when she was growing up. She may have had uh, some exposure to a monotheistic faith, but to what extent? Because maybe her exposure was still extremely tribal based to the extent that individual accountability, as you and I understand it, was not given to her with her mother's milk. So she could not actually bring herself to say that. She, I remember her saying that she regrets the plight of the people, which is classic shame but not a guilt or accountability. So maybe that will help us to understand why some of the responses from some of the African communities, members within the ANC sit so awkwardly on our shoulders and why we have trouble grasping it. But once you understand that the African traditional religious basis that they all come from, and that many haven't broken free from. Now, there are people who've broken free. Obviously, people who have embraced monotheistic faiths, like, let's say, Tutu, for example. He has taken that all on the board, and obviously he knows and he understands, because he works within a Christian perceptual framework, that individual uh, accountability is what is acceptable. But we've got to understand that in African societies, there is still a great problem with this coupled realm and until Africa uncouples their sacred and profane they won't be able to take individual accountability on their shoulders and nor will they be able to express universal compassion. In a tribal society your compassion is only for your family and your neighbor but not beyond the tribal circle. So although we talk about Ubuntu, Ubuntu is confined to the family or the extended family, but it doesn't go to the tribe next door or the tribe on this side. So again, that compassion circle is a small circle. It worked before, but now as people move into cities and they are all mingling and intermarrying and being exposed to so many other things, it is a huge problem. In fact, they have noted that in 
For example, many of the uh, poorer squatter areas, there's um, a great problem for a lot of the people who come in from rural areas because they don't know how to set up extended compassionate networks because they only have experience of familial compassionate networks. And it's very hard for them to understand that it is essential to change. Um, it goes without saying that culture is not cast in stone. Uh, people always say, oh, it's my culture. Culture can do two things. If you are bound to a cultural norm that is maladapted, the culture will eventually implode. And that's happened throughout history. Unless a culture changes, and all cultures change, and take from those around them to adapt so they can survive and move forward, they are doomed to implode. Now, Judaism is a classic example of a culture that adapted. It took from people around them. It took from societies removed from them. We, uh, we are not taught this in um, religious classes, but from an archeological and a historical point of view, we know, for example, that the Axial Age started with writing. And it was during this period, around about 800, that the Old Testament was actually written down, because it was the first time that the written script came to ancient Israel, and they started writing down. We know that it was written down by various scribes and priestly groups and even politicians. Now, we also know that the concept of the Ten Commandments, for example, was taken from the Hammurabi Code, which came from without Israel. So Israel has always learnt that to survive, the culture has to be flexible. All cultures have to be flexible to survive. You have to see what works, what can work for you. Take it on board and then you adapt it within the framework of your own system so that it works for your community. Now, this has happened to a great extent within African communities, and we see it in the traditional African churches. We see it within um, the Church of Zion, and we see it within uh, the Shemba, and there are a lot of smaller little African group churches that you see on Sundays scattered all over. They are classic examples of African traditional religious people subconsciously even understanding the need to revise what they come from to move forward and by putting more and more of Christianity within which is what they've been exposed to with the missionaries since early days within their own framework they are gradually moving to separate the two now I took it, this Axial Age movement, it, was in, it started in Israel. Eisenstadt, the Israeli scholar, reckons Israel is the first point of origin for the movement. It started in Israel. It went to, it started a little bit in Egypt, but it didn't complete itself it, because Egypt remained a death cult religion, but they had it in a social sense. It went to Greece, but in Greece, it was a political, social, and philosophical movement, but not a religious movement because they, they kept their pagan um, deities. It went to Iran. It began in Iran as well. But in Iran, it was prior to Israel, but it wasn't an uncoupling of the realm. It was an understanding of that the world is good and evil, which had never been articulated before. And in, from Israel, it went to India, where the Upanishads, who were also very set on making God a unknowable deity. And then from there, it went to India, uh, to China in Taoism and Confucianism. Now, in, throughout that period, it happened with the written word. So each one, at some stage, must have heard or seen something around them that triggered something, which means that culture is flexible and that communities understand to survive, you must change. And that is why we can see it in the African communities, as I said now, with the African traditional religious churches and even with these very noisy Pentecostal churches that have come in now. Um, not that I'm a fan of Pentecostal religions because it's 
for me, the promise of salvation and someone who's going to swoop down and save you, I think also negates the concept of personal accountability to a great extent. But by the same token, it still awakens the idea of universal compassion. And you often, uh, there's a, an account in one of the um, texts I've read recently where um, members at a Pentecost, a black community Pentecostal <coughs> wedding, um, the mother of the bride was heard saying to someone else, be nice to them, feed them, remember that you must be kind to the stranger. Now, that is not an African traditional religious teaching. That is a Christian teaching that that Pentecostal community has passed on. So that is already the beginning of universal compassion, starting and eroding the tribal limited concept of um, familial and uh, contained tribal uh, compassion. Um, is there any questions? I think maybe finish because it's going to okay. be a lot. <laughs> All right. I, the other thing that's been burning everybody and who's ha that's had everybody on pins and needles has been the, the um, talk about land expropriation. Okay. Um, I think we also need to understand the idea, ideas of land and land ownership that come from the coupled realm is that in coupled realms, and that includes the, funny enough, the uh, Aborigines, uh, all the tribal uh, Polynesians, the American uh, Red Indians, the Inuit, is that land doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to God and the community. So there's no concept in those coupled realm communities, including Africa, of individual land ownership. So it's when they talk about land expropriation, it's not that they want the land, well, maybe today some of them think that they want it for themselves, but they want it back for, the, for everyone, okay? The only problem is, of course, that we are not living in that particular time frame, in that lifestyle anymore. We are now living in a modern world driven by technology with a coupled, decoupled realm, and we are living in a society where uh, commerce rules. So we need to have uh, private land ownership for people to be able to produce enough food to feed all the cities. In a tribal area, obviously it was easy because everybody was equal. The, the, farming, the men who farmed their fields were lined up. They produced. If there was enough food produced that year, everybody had enough. If there wasn't enough due to bad weather, everybody went without because it was equal. But that's where the story in, of the um, seven lean years and seven um, uh, <coughs> years of plenty are so interesting because that is also an axial shift. The understanding that you can overcome hardship by pulling together and producing more when times are plentiful and storing it. Whereas in African traditional religious society, if the year is good, they don't store because it's not part of their system. It's just not the way they do it. If everyone's got plenty, there's plenty. If, everyone, uh, if there isn't, everyone goes short. So it's a very interesting thing. <coughs> so now this concept of land, uh, land ownership is not working in our world. We, we now all live in cities and we need to be fed. So if we were to hand over all the productive farms to people who are not farmers. Um, there's still this, we've seen it in, in Zimbabwe, they still, they revert to subsistence farming. In other words, just enough for the group that's on the farm and not producing to send to the city. So there's a shortage because it's still linked to the coupled realm. And this is the problem that we're all worried about here, is that, or farmers are worried about, if, if that happens, you and I should be worried about, will there be maize on the shelf? Mm -hmm. Unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, uh, I, I don't know which point to, 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 to yeah. start touching on.
one. Yes. Just have, I'm going to chair this, okay? Yeah. Because there are quite a lot of people who yeah. already want to speak, okay? So I don't know which, which point you're touching first, but let's start off with the farming. In South Africa, there's a very interesting history with the British and with the Afrikaners in terms of how they ruled the land. In British uh, areas where the vote was allowed, we see the advancement in terms of the Eastern and Western Cape specifically, where more than 100 years ago, black uh, uh, people were being educated in Harvard University because there was an incentive. If you educated, if you can exactly, produce- Exactly, I started with the pauses, I know. Uh, 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 exactly, so if you can produce, you can vote, yes. and that encouraged lots of people of course, that's uh, the uh, to, 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 the to, uh, to, uh, to be educated. Yes, yes. So it's not as simple as, 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 as what you portray it. Um, here in, in, in Gauteng, mm -hmm. in the Gauteng I'm area, up until... I'm not anything simply. Uh, uh, up up and, up until, sorry, let me just... Uh, yeah. I don't want to demean anybody or any belief yeah. system. All I'm doing is pointing out to the basic structure of classic ATR. Yeah. And what you're telling me is what I know, is that it moved forward. It moved forward, especially within the causes along the, the Cape's uh, but, side but, there. But, 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 but the issue is always been what is the incentive. Right here on the reef, up until 1937, black farmers outfarmed white farmers. Mm -hmm. And the incentive was the fact that as long as they pay the taxes, mm -hmm. As long as they pay the taxes, they weren't going to be forced to work on the mines. Yes. It got to a point where, where, where the black farmers were so wealthy that they had to be robbed of the land to be put into you're the correct, mines. You're correct, you're correct. But I'm not talking about this time. I'm yeah. talking about before the advent of the mine I'll, 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 How the system works? I want to talk in terms of ancient times uh, as well. I don't know if you've read Carden Armstrong's yes. uh, book. Mm -hmm. She talks about the Axel Age and she talks around about 500 BC. That is when the real change happens and it seems to happen uh, si simultaneously. You have Lao Tzu walking uh, in yes, the earth, you have yes, Buddha walking yes, the yes, earth, you have yes. the prophets in, 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 in I didn't want to go into that because I wanted to keep it to Judaism now. Zoroastrianism, yes, Zoroastrianism. Yes. And you, you point to Osiris specifically. If you read this, the psalm about the rivers of Babylon, you can see that the Jews were the unsophisticated society being brought to a much more sophisticated yes, yes. society. That's right. And the understanding did not come from Israel, but it came from the northern part of Iran. This concept of light and darkness, which we do in Yotzer War every, every Saturday. It, it spread light, throughout, not only to light, Judaism. Uh, it, it, yeah. it spread throughout, but mm. the Jews learned from the Persians because uh, from, from an archaeological right. uh, uh, mm. age in the Holy Land, you can see that distinction. Before uh, 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 500 BC, mm. There's lots of idols in That's Jewish right. settlements. Yeah, After 500 BC, there's no more idols in oh, Jewish settlements. No, no, society. I, I did to, to, to differ. There were still idols because yeah. otherwise we wouldn't have formulated the shmah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, oh, oh, and we know oh, from oh, digging up homes, even then, in, my, in Jerusalem from um, four or five hundred years ago, they still, under the floors of the Israel, Israelite houses, are still all the little figures of Asherah. So idols have been with us. Until recent but, times. But, but then I want to touch on the on the on the last point and hand it over to uh, to someone else. This concept of individualism. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a businessman, and, and, and business history is of interest to me. Mm -hmm. So the issue in terms of individualism is very much a Far Eastern concept, specifically a Chinese concept, and that is why China has for five thousand years being at the head because uh, of, of of society. So contrary to what people believe, the Chinese moved. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 like Classical they, they, China had it, but they, Mayo they, took they, they, the compassion away. Yeah, so they, they, they're very, mm, very individualistic, and if you mm. see when the concept of individualism comes into Western society, mm. only then does the Western, the Western world move in terms of wealth. Mm. And that is only really in the last three, four hundred years. Yes. It is not a, 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 a an, an, an ancient and ingrained concept. But I'm not talking in about I'm not talking all. about individualism in the marketplace alone. I'm talking about individualism I'm, in the I'm, sense I'm, of I'm taking talking, individual I'm, I'm accountability. Talking, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about individualism in relig in a re religious concept as well. China, uh, 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 um, the Chinese principle. But we're not speaking of China now. We're talking about Israel. If, yeah. if, if, we, if we take it on the West, on the Western mm. society, uh, Western world, mm. the more people have uncoupled themselves from religion mm. in the Western world, the more no, 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 the West. This is not uncoupling from religion. 
This is not to be seen as the uncoupling of religion. This is the separation of the sacred and the profane, where man takes responsibility for yeah. his own destiny and for the welfare of his man. It's not giving up religion at all. It mustn't be confused with that. The, this is up, in, up, in, up until a hundred. Just, just one last point. Up until a hundred years ago, there was book, books written in the Western world the difference between Catholicism and Protestant, mm. Protestantism. Protestant, sorry, English is not my first. Uh, it's not my first language. So there was books written between yeah. uh, the difference between why Protestants prosper and Catholics are behind, and it's a very similar concept to what you're talking about. That is, about the work here. ethic is it's, not the same uh, as that. You're talking it's, it's not, it's not no, about the, the work, work ethic. ethic has got nothing to do with a separate realm. It's not about the work, e work ethic, it's, it's about a belief system, uh, 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 a system. So this concept of, of, of collectivism is mm. not a unique African concept. No, I, no, travel, it's I travel not. throughout the it's Middle not. East, and the concept of saying, inshallah, God willing, uh, uh, things will happen, and not taking individual responsibility mm -hmm. is very common throughout uh, uh, very many Catholic I cultures. I mean, Jews do it as Italy. well, but it shouldn't be that way. Right. It should. It is not <laughs> the ethos of monotheism. Yes. But by saying it, like uh, we say it in Judaism as well, but that doesn't mean that you are saying what Judaism stands for. Mm. It's just that it's man's inclination to abdicate responsibility. Hence, our belief in messiahs. Which is very dangerous. Okay, let's go to somebody else. Um, Tura. Tura. Yes, Tura I actually else. would like to refer to uh, the ancient of days, mm. with the continent of Africa being the mother of the universe. Mm. And as my ancestry land is in the Eastern Cape, mm. I know of a word called Ngolobane. No. Which, no, no, I'm telling you. Mm. Ngolobane, that's where I know my grandmother used to mm. go and take mm. the storage. Mm of the food mm -hmm. that they plowed and mm. put this, the food in there. So we had started. Yes, but that's already post Afri uh, arrival of no, the no, Europeans. No, no, it was no, no, it's not. You go to Leidenberg, yes. uh, Machata store, mm -hmm. where farming was done mm -hmm. long before Europeans came here. And the concept of Ubuntu, I think we have to explore that further. Because what you are saying about Ubuntu is not true. Mm -hmm. Because Ubuntu is a universal concept. I've done a research the entire continent. Mm -hmm. I find that it all corresponds. The concept of Ubuntu is broad. It's mm -hmm. not like you say. Look, Ubuntu. even the BT, the no, African scholar says to it's say, confined it, to the family. That's to say I look for my family mm -hmm. and my mm -hmm. surroundings. Mm -hmm. Ubuntu goes a long way. I can mm -hmm. bring a lot of professors who can tell you about the concept of Ubuntu when colonization was here and they. They were supposed to study and go to Fort Hare and did not have money. They'll tell you but how. My sweetheart, you've just you've just given yourself away. When they went to study, there no, was no was colonization. Study, there was no study prior to colonization. No, no, that was colonization. So that's already exposure to no, no, you don't already understand. To I'm talking about race. the concept of Ubuntu. The concept of Ubuntu, colonization can mean and force African to go to school. And today, if you don't speak English, you're not educated. <coughs> but who is not educated here? When somebody flies thousands and thousands of kilometers to a foreign land and can't speak even one language, it's the person that flies and doesn't speak that language. No, no, I mean, what's that got to do with Ubuntu? No, it's what I'm saying to you, that Ubuntu meant, you, you know what? It, it's it's got to be present, compassion. If it's day, not compassion, no, then it's not Africans are born compassionate. They are very, we, we have all these uh, qualities, social, um, I, I never said you weren't compassionate. No, but this is a distortion of the African, no, African no, no. philosophy. May I Even ask where you get your research regarding oh, the African okay. tradition? I'll give you my little. Mabiti is one of the most renowned African scholars, mm -hmm. okay? And he himself admits that prior to the uncoupling of the realm, um, the uh, attitude was that it was confined to the tribe because there was no need. You didn't move beyond your tribe. Mm -hmm. You, you were self-supporting, you were so, you were self-contained, you were self-sufficient. There was no true. need to move beyond. It's not true. It, it is only work. when circles began to overlap that the shortfall came. But, as I said, when that happened, as society shifted, obviously things altered. But the intrinsic idea is still to that that's confined to your own group. It doesn't mean that if you're part of that group and you're exposed that you cannot develop or you cannot comprehend and practice it, that's not, not true. It's not true. This is not true. It's a distortion and I apologize because 
you are not really uh, uh, willing to learn from us. We, some of us leave Ubuntu and we leave it up to today. And it's a very but jaded you, opinion yeah, that, you, yeah. that you're giving across because you're also referring to the they. Yeah. Do you um, not see anything wrong in the dialogue that you're using? Hmm. They, as in? Precisely. They, as in what? When, when you're when you uh, referring. Oh. When I speak of okay, African traditional religion, yeah. obviously I'm speaking about Africa. Yeah. When but I speak but, but about but are you, but Israelites, are you, are you talking about they, specific they, South Africa? That Israelites. But are you talking about Israelites specific South Africa? Africa. Because Throughout it's very Africa. complex. Because what yeah, you're saying in the beginning right. isn't true. It's very, very complex African traditions. Of course it is. Yeah. But I'm explaining it going back to any exposure mm. prior to any exposure to European contact. I, 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 you know, I, I it just, comes I, across I just, as though you are saying... Not now. Con con not now. Uh, it, it, it but there are those who are saying that exposure to colonization was a good thing. Yeah. Mm. And I, think I don't think so that it's colonization. I think it is exposure to the, relig the religious uh -huh. ideas that colonization The religions, bought. you are talking about are cults. Anyway, Zion because... Christian Church is a cult. And it all emanates from the Roman Catholic system that actually people uh, split from those uh, uh, churches and started their own churches. There was no church in Africa. People believed there was one God. Of course they weren't. Of course they weren't. That we, I never, they I'm not denying that. Yeah. But the fact that you, you accept that the sacred walks with you, you have no individual accountability. No, there, there's another it's aspect. It's another, it's another, group it's another debate because this uh, representation is so scattered. I don't know where to start, where to go, what to address mm -hmm. here because it's so scattered. You're being, bringing in Africa, you're bringing in religion, you're bringing in a land expropriation. Well, I don't know what, where we're going to. It's not focused. Actually, all we right, have to bring one present. All right, right, Katura, we right. need to give other people yeah. a chance. Let's, let's okay. leave it there. Um, thank you for a topic that is very, very interesting and for an opportunity to actually open it up for discussion. Um, I'd like to just share my experience. I'm a Sangoma, um, I'm Roman Catholic, and I have a Jewish lineage. Um, and I've been very puzzled about why I am traveling this path. Um, and from what you say, I think there are elements of truth in it across the globe. I think within every single tradition, there are levels of consciousness. Mm. So there are people who live out of fear. There are people who live out of anger. There are people who live out of love. And the people who live out of love are at the very highest level of those societies. So it's across the globe. Um, I have a very strong sense of my ancestors walking with me. Um, I have a very strong sense of being protected. And so I think that a lot of Western science and Western study is lacking a sense <coughs> of what is very clear to me in Judaism. Judaism for me is the most practical of all religions that I've come across because it has a very strong sense of the sacred and a very strong sense of what the rabbi calls the mundane rather well, than the profane. profane yeah. um, when, you discuss, when you were discussing tra um, African traditional culture, for me you were also discuss, uh, describing Judaism. Mm -hmm. Prior um, to the... No, even, even today. Mm. Even today. So for me mm. what is missing in a lot of our, our Western understanding of knowledge mm is that Hashem is not an idea. Hashem mm. exists. See, Hashem is real. The minute you insist on a deity existing, yes. you're actually not practicing classical Judaism. Because classical Judaism says there is no name for God. He is unknowable. You cannot define him and you cannot say anything about him. It's different from saying so that Hashem does say, not exist. So you can't even say whether he exists or not. He is above us. Okay, the minute you start to define God, you're not a Jew. Because God, Jews don't define God. Yes. That's why we, we don't come into contact with a person or a vision. We don't see him. Nobody in the Bible has seen God. Even Moses, Moses. it was the essence of God. Yes, but that's but not God. But it assumes that there is something that exists. But so you can't define that it. So, but that's different. Yes, but you that can't. Is different. By, by, not, by trying to define it, you are moving away from classical I'm tradition. not trying to define it. I'm trying, what I am saying 
What I'm saying is, we either believe that something greater, some power that's greater than us exists or it doesn't. There is, what is as, as above soon as, us, yes. removed from us. No, it isn't. That, that is not true. Yeah. Because even in Judaism, in Judaism, in Judaism within yeah. it's within yes. us. Yes. The way that the but rabbis... But not the God. That's what I said. We the sacred vessel. No. Yeah. But not God We're is the not vessel. with us. Yes. yes, we are the, the vessel. The sacredness is in us, but it's not sacred. the sacred above us. It's one and the same thing. The way that the rabbi explained it to me, because as I said to you, I'm Catholic. Mm -hmm. So one of the Christian doctrines is the, oh. the doctrine of the Trinity. And the doctrine of the Trinity basically says God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit emanates in, in Catholicism. It is said God, the Holy Spirit emanates from God the Father and God the Son. In Orthodox Christianity, it is said God emanates from the, um, the Holy Spirit emanates from the Father alone. So I've been I've been researching this and grappling mm -hmm. with this. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. um, and basically, the rabbi at one of our Saturday services just says, you know, it's the light. The light comes in, comes into us, and it's 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 you know. We are the vessels thing. of the sacred. Yes, we are the vessels but of the sacred. Not but we cannot be we the vessels gods. of the sacred if the sacred does not exist. No, I never said it doesn't exist. But you cannot define that it, it exists. But that's different. So what I'm basically saying is that. This is my point, and I'm going to leave mm. it at that. What I'm saying is, from my perspective, mm. what is lacking in a lot of our understanding of the world and of reality today, and the reason that we are so chaotic, is that we don't have a sense that there is a power that is greater than us that mm. works through us. When we don't yeah. know that, we become chaotic. Okay. When I, we know that, think, we can become I think we've actually discovered what you're saying here. I think what you're saying is that we demand proof of existence. Yes. But proof of existence is not part of classic Judaism. Yes, I don't okay. demand proof of So existence. that is the problem today, is that people don't embrace religion until they have proof of the existence of God. And there is no proof. It is a faith. It is a leap into the dark. Not if you've experienced it. That is a different then it's a story. Leap into the light. That is a different. different story. But most of us don't experience it. So we have to then take a leap. Yes. But then again, for me, I haven't experienced it in the sense that you speak of. But for me, there is definitely power much greater than I am. Much, much greater than I am. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. okay. Um, to uh, add upon and uh, make a correction, when you say in Africa we are like we think our ethnicity group we more people, it's not true because there's this good news saying it says in the way enter a kaula as this way. So it means um, where you come from within your enclave, it's especially with boys, it's uh, men, it's really uh, advisable. When you go out, you marry a lady, they say from us are far away. They say it's very really unencouraged and acceptable because when you've been that person within I think it's going to teach you a lot. Now you do compare and learn that like, okay, yeah, these other people are not like us. Let me learn and see how they do it. And it, it fell stretches on <clears throat> in Africa, before the coming of the white men, all our like leaders, our kings, they would prepare because there was a promise that there'll be these people will be coming. And these people, when they come on the one hand, they'll be carrying a button on one hand, and the other hand, they'll be carrying a book. Mm. The button symbolizes money, and then the book, mm. a, a religious book. Mm. I don't know which one. And then when these people come, um, make sure that all your people, I mean, you learn to live with them. You don't fight. Learn what is good with them and stay with them. Actually, for South Africa, all the ethnic groups, you can ask Venda, long before 1500s, just long before, and then the kings. Who received the prophecy is invited all the people and then explained to the people is this and that and that. So when we were young, we go to our, our grandmothers, when the small boys, they'll tell you those stories, all our stories, and say, okay, this and this, this, this and that, and that those morals and all these mm. things. So I think the research for Africa is still less cool. It needs a lot of I'm research. not denying that, that I've covered that in my work, that there was anticipation that people were willing to learn. That is what happens when societies start to reach out they change when they start to accept different ideas they change and that is what is happening and it started it was a good thing
Are you I think that in, in the end, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, change is inevitable, but you can choose whether it's for the good of all or for the all maladaptive. I, I, I just want to add to, to some of the discussions that is here. For, for me, Judaism and, and African traditional religion actually matches up very perfectly. Matches up perfectly. They don't. This, 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 because this, you're thinking this, of this, the early this, this, Let me this, read this to you. Can this, you this, let him finish this, first? Let him finish. Let him finish. This, 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 this is a scripture that says, um, uh, "Where you find your God in the highest mountains, mountains in the deepest of forests." That sounds very much like an African practice. But that scripture there's, there's, prior there's, there's, to the axial age. Every, every, every Friday and Saturday, there's the, uh, 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 the, the praying for your ancestors, your, your, your mothers, your grandmothers, and your grandfathers. No, when it's, we it's, say. It's, it's an appeal. You start but, off. but when we say Abram and Isaac, what you're saying is that religion is not a uniform idea in every person's head. So the God of Abram can be. A God that is not the God of Isaac, and the God of Isaac need not be the God that's Leah's or Rachel's, because we all have our own concept of God. So that's saying there is not a uniform concept of God. There's no orthodoxy in Judaism, where you all have to worship one particular interpretation of God. But it doesn't say many gods. It's the, the, the way the, you the, see the, God the, in the, your the head. Visit, the visiting of ancestral graves, specifically for, for uh, in, in orthodoxy, is very, very common to pray at graves. Mm. In Islam, it's But we pray at the graves of people who pass away in our own family. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we accept that they are responsible for our destiny. <laughs> Not in Judaism. in Judaism. No, 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 no. Not in Judaism. So. No, no, no. So. Then you're not a Jew because then you're already <laughs> abdicating. No, wow. Judaism is not. Judaism is accepting responsibility for your own life without any intervention from deities, spirits, or ancestors or angels. On, 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 on the comment, uh, just on one uh, the last thing, you, you spoke about the storage of grain. One of the most famous fights of Shaka mm -hmm. is uh, uh, with Indwanda, where mm -hmm. he retreats. And what it does is it shifts the storage of the grain and burns the land. Uh -huh. So the, the concept, so this Sports concept of, of storing uh, uh, grain has been a long. Uh, uh, it uh, was coming, but in traditional African societies, the classical period before it wasn't there. I accept, like this man has explained, and I agree, things were changing. Nothing is static. But, but the, the initial the, belief the, is not that. Just, 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 just the last point on an historical point. Okay, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh, Sheikh Diop. <laughs> Sheikh Diop, who is a very famous uh, Senegalese uh, scholar, and I'm mm. sure that you've come across him, first pointed out the link between Hebrew and the African language, oh. uh, uh, languages, and the fact that many of the African languages are linked right across from West Africa. Mm. And that, 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 that is that, a very that, dubious theory. It's not. Because it has been substantially. It's a Semitic language, and African that, that, languages that, that, are not that Semitic. The Semitic languages are linked, and the oldest Semitic languages actually, actually comes from East Africa. Documented Semitic languages comes out of East Africa. Uh, as an uh, archaeologist, no, no, I must tell you, I've never no. heard this theory. Okay, uh, never. Uh, please, please look at uh, Chef Diop and then look at the writings after Chef Diop because it was a concept that was firstly rejected, mm. like so many other concepts in terms of Egypt. And now oh, it is a concept way, that is yes. being embraced. Okay. And now it is a concept that is embraced from a historical point of view to say that uh, we now don't talk of Hermetic and Semitic people, mm -hmm. we talk of Afro Asiatic oh, people. Right. And that began with, with people like Chef Dio. So he was repeated in his time. But as history advances, and then as people's understanding advances, mm -hmm. and as people's minds open mm -hmm. up to a concept mm -hmm. that Africa was not as dark. Mm -hmm. uh, um, or as unsophisticated as was, what, what people believe, yeah. so people can embrace the okay. fact that Africa right. also contributes. Um, look, to everyone is entitled to their own interpretation of God, but the classical Jewish inter interpretation is best summed up here. Iconoclasm in Judaism leads to the conclusion that any God must ultimately be universal and nameless, a nameless God. The natural result of settling for an abstract and unknowable deity, unknowable, is then to force uh, instead on human beings and life itself uh, the supremely sacred, uh, make humans the supremely sacred vessels of existence. There is no one around to pray to per se, no idol, nothing like that. So, and no ancestral graves either. So one learns to enact sanctity through ethical behavior. 
Okay, iconoclasm destroys all man-made symbols, including graves, and leads to abstract monotheism, which in turn leads to an ethos of social justice. And then getting back to Israel, uh, to uh, Semitic languages. The Semitic language is confined to the, to the um, area of the ancient Near East. And Egypt, recent work in Egypt has shown they've taken mummies, they've done the um, DNA on the skulls with a new method. The DNA shows that they were not African at all. Oh, oh. Okay, well, there you go. I'm sorry. Well, they are. Oh, wow. They are. This is oh, the DNA. Oh, that's it, that oh. from, This is the work done from um, German uh, and, and uh, Scandinavian universities. The DNA is from um, the Mediterranean basin and from Spain. So uh, that, that is the DNA, it's not, not my true. DNA. Oh my it's God, you can't be doing DNA. That is in this Bible. Have you, have, so have, have, have you looked at the black at, uh, the, the black at DNA? The scholarly work of the black at DNA? Uh, um, you, uh, well, it depends. You do, with scholarly work, uh, you've got to be very careful who you define as a scholar. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's from, I, I can't remember the American university, <laughs> like, but, uh, but it's three volumes and, uh, it's, and it's on uh, it's the very same good. issue. Um, yeah. And it's a continuation of people like, like <laughs> Chef Diop. And then the other is just in most recent times, read the work of people like Robert Duvall and them um, on, on Egypt specifically. And, Look, and all I can tell you is that you can Google it. The DNA of ah, all the okay. uh, mummies so done so far is uh, from the Mediterranean basin and uh, from Spain, strangely so enough. Which mummies are you talking about? Um, the mummies that they have in the in uh, various um, museums and that, they've done it. Let me just, I don't have my phone with me. I can give you the actual universities they've done it. It's very interesting. Uh, of course, it's caused yeah. Why are you doing that? Yeah. I just wanted to say that um, what I found interesting about what you were saying is um, in terms of Ubuntu only looking after your own. I mean, that sounded so Jewish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because that's what Jews do, you know. Um, yes and no, because if Jews only looked after their own, the rabbis wouldn't have mar marched with Martin Luther King. We wouldn't be working in townships yeah. here. It's, it's okay, so we do the more your research. It's, 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 it's universal it's compassion. It's not just universal <laughs> compassion. When Judaism recedes and it becomes close, like it did in Poland with the Hasidic movement, and it becomes a closed movement it becomes fossilized. Mm. So what we have here in, in Johannesburg, to a great extent, because classic orthodoxy is universal Judaism. Sect Judaism, any of the Hasidic movements, are closed and look more after their own. It's a recession, it's a closing in. So only Hasidic? The Hasidic what about movements the... are classic closed movements. So. Oh. Yes. Yeah. yeah no, this this has got nothing to do with this yeah. conversation per se. But just to add on to what you said, I've recently been reading a book called The Book of Joy, written by the Dalai Lama oh, and yes. the Tutu, mm -hmm. both two men whom I hold in the highest regard. And backing up their theory, because this book is about how we find joy. Backing up the theory is neuropsychological studies being done in America now about the plasticity of the brain. Unfortunately, being my age, I have senior moments and I can't remember everything that I read, but for me what was fascinating, and that does um, uh, resonate with what you're saying and also resonates with what you say, is that the neuropsychology has discovered that we as human beings have got three circuits of that lead to joy. The, the first one is a little bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is that if you have your basic, if you, you first have to have your basic survival intact. Unfortunately, I can't remember what the second one is. But the third one is we have altruism, compassion, linked to the release of endorphins in our brain that makes us compassionate. The kicker is to those who look and sound like ourselves. This is an ancient neurological setting in the brain. 
And what the Dalai Lama say, says, and what Tutu says, is that today, as modern human beings, we have to fight the kicker mm -hmm. and become passionate, compassionate mm -hmm. to all. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a neurological basis for <clears throat> the link of joy and compassion and altruism. There is the animalistic for our own, like a lion will kill another lion's cubs. Yeah. And that we, as people who have reached this level of sophistication, the kicker is to undo the kicker that says just our own. So, for me, that it is makes exactly it why it is. We are so often reminded in Judaism to be kind to the stranger. Why do we have to be reminded? Because we weren't to start. Yeah, and no group. Was There's no to start. sin in admitting that to, at the beginning we weren't. All communities, as she said, tended to be inward looking. Yeah. That is why we have to remind ourselves to look beyond ourselves and to the stranger and the widow and the orphan because we don't do it unless the orphan is our, our sibling's child or something. We don't look that. We drive past this every day. People at traffic lights begging. How many of us stop? How many of us do anything? We don't. We've become... I call it compassion fatigue. It's very difficult, but we have to remind ourselves to be compassionate every single day. And, and to just, claim that we're all compassionate is, is not true. a complete lie. But can I just yes. link? You said you want to keep it Jewish. Yeah. So I'd like to link it to something Jewish. And I'm talking about Israel now and the na narrative around Israel within <laughs> South African Jews and in Israel. There is no compassion for the other. Mm -hmm. We as Jews are not practicing compassion for the other. Mm -hmm. So it's not an altruistic um, component that is just for Jews. Mm -hmm. It's no, for no. Everybody, everyone. But from an animalistic point of view, the instinct is to protect we your are own. hard wired to protect ourselves. Uh -oh. And, and our then, own. once all those other things have been attended to, and now that we think mm -hmm. and we have sophisticated mm -hmm. reasoning, we need to go beyond. We need to go beyond. To so, what I'm doing here today is I'm not pointing fingers or demeaning. And what I'm trying to do is to push you, to push you to move and walk the talk of religion, which is to be accountable, to be responsible, to take care of your fellow man, and understand that the welfare of your fellow man is your responsibility, not God's. And your That's fellow what woman. I'm, that's what, yes, co, what did uh, Trudeau say? Your co-people or something. Yeah, your, this is what I'm pushing you to do. I'm not pointing fingers. We have to move forward. We have to remind ourselves every day, this is what we need to be, to be accountable. Most important, to be accountable. Once you're accountable and you understand that what you do affects not only your child and your parent, but people in your circle, the whole world, then, then we are walking our religious talk. Until then, we're not doing it. And to kid ourselves that we've always been this way, or that we still, or that we are, and that we just, we are lying to ourselves. We are lying to ourselves. We really are. Actually, I want to say to you, uh, that, uh, we, are, we have been for centuries, politically, spiritually, economically, uh, oppressed and epitomized to the, uh, to the powers that be in the world. Doesn't mean to say we weren't here before. We were here before we survived, we ate, we had shared. No one disputes that. Yes, yeah, no, no. Uh, the the, the <coughs> representation can't. It, you know, it's just uh, trying to mm -hmm. make it as if we are, children, we are scholars of European. We were here before. I never we, said that. School, you are students of Mas European. Mas you reading no, that, not no, me. No, that, that's you your reading that. No, you're reading that. You're you reading know, it. Because we don't need to, to be taught compassionate. We are born with I think everybody needs to be I compassion. think everybody needs yeah. to be taught We are born with Everybody needs to be Why do you have to be reminded? Why must we be reminded? We all have to be reminded. Don't say that I'm tired. We all have to be reminded. Don't get up. We all have to be reminded. No, we are not being reminded because we are being oppressed and we do with the little that we have, we share with our fellow men. Okay. We have doing sharing in, in Soweto when I was young. People have been doing sharing, selling Amapunya and that 
Makuinya one, makuinya that is salt is for the neighbor. If we don't give it to her, no, it's not. We don't need no, 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 don't gang up. I'm, I'm talking to her, isn't it? We are doing something but that sorry, is not allowed. Can I just yes. say that? Yes. 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 But the thing is that one can't tell me and it's not history because if the mummies were from, because what I know from the land of Kush, the pharaohs are from the land of Kush. Nefertiti was born in the land of Kush. Queen Sheba is from Ethiopia. Nothing that came from, instead, Greeks came to colonize Africa and Egypt. And then the Lord is it, 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 it documented. So you mean to say the book of, of, of Professor Philip um, Tobias? No, first of all, the, the Egypt is not my book. If you read Philip Tobias, excuse me, um, I think we're going completely off at a tangent here. No, no, we're not. Here. We started an analysis. Yeah. Uh, we analysis. gave off a we detention here. here. For an the, the, that's the because scholarly that work done on Egypt. You, uh, you can read it up on your own. And research. you can take it up with no, the German no, university no, who's done the work. But no, not we are not going it's to a case of shooting the carrier. We are not going to allow you to spend our time or place our minds. No, I'm not the carrier of the news. I'm just the carrier of the news. I'm not the person who did the work. It's wrong. If this is about it. I just think that people are personalizing it. I've understood yes, what you're talking about no. is that humanity mm. no the mummy has humanity mm. as an animal because mm. we are animals mm. and we have a reptilian brain yes. and then a brain that to over that and then a higher brain with mm. higher thinking more sophistication yes. when we were still reacting with our reptilian brain mm. and the brain that came after and I can't remember what it's called we all were for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It was claw and feather and fur against each yeah. other. And, look, and what you're saying is that now... Any disaster brings it out yeah. anyway. You know, whenever right. there's a, a war or something, we all revert to nationalism. Right. And the genocide so so are happy to are typical examples of compassion gone so around, I, I which is why we need to be remind, uh, right. so reminded. So I didn't see you as the quite... The Tutsis, the Croatian mm -hmm. situation. I mean, the as we go towards war. the Kurds and the Syrian that's war. That's why we have war. That's exactly what's happening now. That's why we need to be reminded. So that's what I just want yes. to point out. It's not that no, group or this group or that. No, it's not. human. It's human we nature to be an in group about. versus yeah. the out group. Yeah. But it's human yeah. nature. Right. But we have to break it. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And that's what the Dalai Lama had to say. We have I, to break it. I, I just want to say, um, I've, I've listened very carefully to what it is that you're saying. I hear the same that what you are saying. Mm. My debate is is this: it is not as clean cut as what you say it is. No, it no, is not no, as clean. Is clean uh, 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 but if you, if, if you just give me a moment to complete what, I, what, what I'm saying and what I'm debating with you, these things are not as clean cut as what, what you're saying. Things? Uh, that Africa is where, where you say it is and the rest of the world No, no, no. Uh, this uh, is where uh, tribal uh, classic ATR stands. Yes, sorry. Well, they're not yes. there anymore. Yes. They're not there anymore. It, 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 who's there? African, African traditional religions. Uh, they're not locked there but, anymore. But what, They've moved beyond that. But, uh, but that's where it starts. <laughs> my, my, my debate with you is mm. that these are evolving concepts. Mm. These are evolving concepts, and the only thing flexible in your life is history, because history is reinvented. Like the African expression says, mm -hmm. the, 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 the tale of the hunt is only written by the hunter, not by the lion. Yes. So the, the, the reality is that history is flexible, and each one adapts it, and shapes um, it, and recreates it. This is not history, the, this is sociology. Whatever it may be, there's, 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 there's others that have, that have a different experience, a different insight, and 